tuberculosis to drug tuberculosis. And uh, there's been noted uh, an increase of DRTB in the country. And as we know, Kenya is among the 30 high burden countries um, for TB. And um, treatment for a patient with MDRTB takes about two years, and it costs approximately $15,000 per patient. So today we are, uh, I have the pleasure of um, introducing the facilitator for today, Dr. Washira, who will be shedding more light on MDRTB and how we can optimize care for our patients. Dr. Washira is a senior technical advisor, TB, working with CHS. He works closely with the national TB program, and he has a wealth of uh, experience in both clinical and programmatic management of tuberculosis. So it is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Washira. Karibu sana, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Tabitha, and thank you to the KNH team for sending me this invite. Uh, I am honored to be here with you to present um, on how to optimize the quality of care for DRTB. Um, for those who never handled a DRTB patient, I think the information that uh, Dr. Tabitha has given is a good uh, beginning point for us because she has outlined the key challenges with DRTB, one being making the diagnosis, and two, providing quality care so that we have optimum um, treatment outcomes at the end of treatment. So um, as a country, uh, we, 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 we do have a lot of DRTB, but uh, as a consequence of the good work that has been going on in Kenya since 2011, when DRTB treatment was decentralized from Kenyatta to all facilities in all 47 counties, and the introduction of new tools, um, Kenya in 2020 was actually delisted from among the high burden DRTB countries by the WHO. Uh, and this, this is a good thing for the country because it means that uh, we have put uh, measures in place to uh, adequately identify people with DRTB in the community and also provide care. So what, what is the current focus of care is one, improving the quality of care that we are giving, and two, providing differentiated care for DRTB uh, based on the profile of the patients that we have. Um, so maybe I'll just request that the presentation be put up um, for me to begin. Yeah, so my presentation did not focus on a lot of the case finding uh, challenges. Um, although we do know that um, uh, Kenya is only detecting about 23% of all incidents, incident DRTB cases um, each year. And this is uh, data from as recently as last year. Um, however, despite this gap, uh, we do know that the main uh, challenge is access to drug susceptibility testing. And so the National TB program, uh, together with the partners supporting them, have been working on um, uh, uh, scaling up access to drug susceptibility testing. Um, that I will do a very brief uh, two slides at the end of this presentation, just to show the team what is in the current guidelines and um, what does it mean for DRTB care. But for now, um, I, I want us to go quickly into the outline where we look at what quality of care is defined as, um, uh, both to the patient and to the health worker, and then looking at what is the reality for a DRTB patient? Uh, I want us to move away from what we know as healthcare workers um, to what the journey that a DRTB patient actually takes from when we give a diagnosis of DRTB to the point where we complete treatment. And then we look at a bit, a few proposals for how to optimize uh, quality of care. And then we conclude uh, this presentation. And I want to take as little time as possible on the presentation so that we have adequate time for discussion and uh, questions. Next. Yeah, so for DRTB patients, um, uh, the reality is uh, despite all the interventions that uh, we put in place as stakeholders, and this include the national program partners, development organizations and agencies, and the frontline health workers providing care. Despite all that, in that intervention, our patients still uh, have challenges accessing delay uh, diagnosis. So we have a lot of delays before we make a diagnosis of DRTB. 
And these delays could be as a result of inadequate surveillance in that the health worker may not be very clear on who are the high risk groups for DRTB so that they actually do surveillance for it. Or secondly, as is the case currently, where there is a challenge in commodity supplies, meaning that we are not able to do surveillance uh, for DRTB as we would like to. Uh, thirdly, um, the poor index of suspicion for TB, and this is an area where we are really working with KNH uh, to try and improve. Um, being a referral facility, a lot of the patients who come to KNH have already been seen at previous uh, uh, health facilities. And unfortunately, a lot of the diagnosis of TB in Nairobi is actually made at Kenyatta National Hospital, which shows a failure in the, in the primary health care structures to diagnose TB, as well as the lower levels of health care service delivery um, to be able to detect and diagnose people with TB. The second delay is treatment. Um, so once we make a diagnosis of drug-resistant TB, on average, it takes about two weeks before we can initiate treatment as we are preparing the patient and ordering the medicines. And uh, due to this delay, we have a lot of losses within the, the health system where someone is diagnosed with DRTB, but as the health system is preparing to initiate them on treatment, the patient actually disappears. The third uh, issue is that we have, there are a lot of challenges in management of DRTB. Uh, for the patient, uh, they take a lot of pills. Um, for injectable free regimen, I know we have reduced the number of pills as compared to previous regimens. However, it still means that a patient is taking a minimum of about five to six tablets each day um, for a period of 18 months, which is a challenge. And then these drugs are associated with a lot of ad adverse drug reactions, uh, ranging from mild drug reactions to life-threatening uh, adverse drug reactions. Um, the fourth uh, reality for our patient is that our healthcare workers, ourselves, we have a very, very negative attitude towards people who are suffering from drug-resistant tuberculosis. So, um, Honestly speaking, uh, anytime you diagnose a DRTB case in a medical ward, um, the first instinct is to discharge that patient uh, for care in the TB clinic. Um, remember, this patient is still requiring uh, medical attention while in the ward, and that's the reason that they were there to begin with. So that attitude actually causes a lot of mental health challenges to our patients, which leads to our fifth reality, uh, the issues surrounding the patients. One, psychosocial issues. We've had instances where um, patients have lost uh, uh, their life, their, their families. Um, uh, 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 ladies have been divorced as a result of having drug resistant TB in Kenya. And this is in the last few years. This is not something very old. Loss of uh, income, where once you're diagnosed with DRTB, what it means is that you cannot continue working for a period until you are no longer infectious. And what that means for a breadwinner is that the family is likely to, to starve or have challenges accessing their, their daily needs. Um, this will lead to issues with adherence and can also lead to loss of relationship again. As a sole breadwinner, these are the challenges and these are the issues. And this is not an exhaustive list. It goes on and on and on. So as health workers, we need to be cognizant that this is what our patients go through when we uh, make a diagnosis of DRTB. Next. Next slide. It's not... Yes, thank you. So um, the other reality for the patient is um, when you chart uh, a patient's uh, journey from the beginning of, uh, from the diagnostic point all the way to the end of treatment, um, this patient uh, has a lot of issues. Uh, in the initial months, especially, and this is a live case. Um, this is a case that was uh, for a patient in Zimbabwe, and it was taken in 2016, uh, and I've borrowed this from uh, the union. I need to mention that. Um, so for this patient, um, they looked at a, a whole cohort. Um, the patients with MDR-TB, and they're also convicted with ART. Now, when you look at um, uh, the, 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 the chart itself, uh, the x-axis looks at the period in months, uh, and uh, the, the, the blocks there are the medicines that the patient is accessing at a particular month. 
So you can see in the first uh, six months, seven months of treatment, um, the patient largely received a lot of the MDR TB medicines, but missed the ART. Um, in month eight, all medicines were available and the patient took them. However, uh, in month seven, again, the lab website was down, so surveillance uh, uh, it was a challenge. Um, month nine and 10, our patient received no treatment, and this was as a result of public workers' strike. Um, and when you look at all this, these are things that are applicable to our setup as a country. Next, we had a period where there were stockouts of uh, drugs, a period where there is heavy rain, so our patients are not able to access uh, treatment uh, health facilities. There was a period where there was a fire, so medical records were lost. Uh, there's a period where our patients did not have the money to access uh, daily dots at the facility, so they missed some visits and stock out of other key commodities. So when you look at this, it tells us as health workers that, um, that we shouldn't just, um, uh, when a DRTB patient tells you that they missed a dose of, of treatment, we shouldn't only uh, be concerned about our, our patient's intake of the medicines. Also try and find out the underlying reasons. Why are our people not taking medicines yet? They know these are the medicines that will give them the quality of life that they require. Um, look at the health system itself. Um, as it is right now, um, we have an issue of access to HIV test kits. We have an issue of access to, um, in some places, to ART. We have some issues, as it is right now, access to GeneXpert and the Culture uh, NTRL network. Um, uh, Nairobi County has just, I don't know if the, the health worker strike is over, so a health worker strike is ongoing in the nearby county. Um, we have a lot of challenges that we can apply to our patients. So well, let us change the way we look at our DRTB patients so that we can improve their quality of care. Next. Um, again, for the DRTB outcomes, uh, when you're looking at what is likely to impact uh, a patient to not have a positive outcome, um, you can uh, break them down into social and economic factors, uh, poverty, patients without social support, uh, patients who have unstable living circumstances, such as those living in the streets, uh, the homeless, uh, and, and people who have abused substances. Um, uh, issues around stigma and people's beliefs about TB and its treatment also affect outcomes. Uh, where we've had cases where some people stopped taking DRTB treatment because they were told that uh, DRTB is caused by witchcraft. And this is in Nairobi. Um, so it tells you that this is an issue. Uh, social and economic factors actually come in um, to, uh, in a large way, contribute to either your patients having good outcomes or poor outcomes. For the health system, when you have poor health infrastructure, a lack of IPC activity, uh, uh, facilities, poorly trained or not poorly, inadequately trained or supervised healthcare personnel so that we are not offering standardized care. People who have poor relationship with patients, so patients are not willing to open up and tell us what are the issues that they are having and inadequate engagement of the communities in uh, providing support to patients at community level. For the patient themselves, issues around stigma and issues around inadequate knowledge about TB. And for therapy-related, treatment-related factors, remember, uh, this is a long treatment duration. We are currently using a period of 18 months for MDR-RR uh, treatment, uh, where they take a lot of pills, which have a lot of associated drug reactions, all this leading to poor uh, treatment outcomes at the end, unless uh, mitigated. Next slide. So what do we need to do? We've looked at the reality and the challenges that our patients uh, face. So uh, for us to address uh, the first gap uh, where we talked about inadequate access to surveillance, one, we need to make sure that we are preventing the emergence of drug resistance. And in the previous webinars, we've been looking at drug susceptible TB. Um, there's a statement that I like to use anytime I'm doing a session on DRTB. The best time to treat DRTB is when it's still DSTB because majority of our drug resistant TB patients actually 
begin the journey as drug susceptible TB patients. So when we do this, we will have DSTB with treatment success. The second uh, way to uh, prevent drug resistance is to strengthen adherence to the drug susceptible TB medicines. So all our patients who are lost to follow up, we need to be very keen to follow them up and ensure that we bring them back to care and they don't miss um, the, 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 they don't miss the treatment uh, as prescribed. Finally, uh, the education and the counseling of TB patients will go a long way to, to minimize the risk of uh, transmission and prevent propagation of drug resistance. I uh, will remove the first two because that does not come in directly. However, the aim of treatment is to cure the patient and minimize the risk of, of death. Um, so this is the first part of when you're talking about uh, providing quality for DRTB, one is to treat DSTB well, to provide adequate education to our drug susceptible TB patients, and also equip the health workers to be able to provide standardized high quality treatment. Next slide. Um, I will not go through this slide, but uh, since this is shared with the, the, the research team, I think it should be uh, distributed uh, where we need to know how drug resistance comes about so if for us to know where to intervene. Um, uh, along these cascades, both for acquired drug resistance and primary drug resistance, you can see at the bottom of that uh, slide, there's a box titled factors that can prevent transmission or progression. So as health workers, we need to know that how can we intervene for an, a patient with acquired drug resistance to prevent them from moving from drug susceptible TB exposure to drug susceptible TB infection. So here we want to say one, we do IPC and we look at the host immunity. So nutrition and other medical care for our patients needs to be improved. Diabetes care needs to be improved and so on and so forth. This is just a chart that will uh, go a long way to help our health workers know how to intervene at which particular point. Next. Secondly, to provide quality of DRTB care, we need to provide timely diagnosis of drug resistant TB. And for us to do this first, we must do, we must increase uh, the number of people who we are suspecting to have DRTB is those people that we call presumptive DRTB cases. And presumptive DRTB cases are anyone who has previously been treated for TB, whatever form, be it treatment after loss to follow up, treatment after failure of first line, treatment history unknown, um, uh, uh, other uh, previous, uh, previously treated who had a successful outcome but has now come in with TB, all those require to be uh, tested using uh, a modality that can do drug susceptibility testing. The other groups is contacts of DRTB. Anyone who is a contact of a DRTB case needs to have surveillance done. Um, healthcare workers with TB symptoms, refugees with TB symptoms, prisoners with TB symptoms, people who are not responding well to DSTB drugs, that is people with uh, positive smears at month two or later. Um, and finally, anyone with TB symptoms while on TB preventive therapy needs to have surveillance conducted. And for this surveillance, we need to have a modality that can do drug susceptibility testing at the first available opportunity and the modalities that we have in Kenya, we have uh, uh, molecular tests, which include uh, gene expert, MTB Reef assay, um, gene expert, MTB Reef Ultra. Uh, we have line probe assay, which is offered at the LPA labs in uh, Nairobi, um, Mombasa, and Kilifi, um, Machakos, and Transoya. And then finally, we have the new tech modalities like uh, TrueNut, which offers drug susceptibility testing to isoniazid as well as rifampicin. Um, we also have the phenotypic methods. Uh, those are the molecular or genotypic methods. The phenotypic methods that we have, we have solid media uh, culture or liquid culture systems, and then rapid speciation followed by drug susceptibility testing for both first line and second line 
uh, uh, drugs. Next. So um, to say that you're offering high quality DRTB care, one, you need to ensure that you're offering immediate access uh, to holistic care. And holistic care uh, is care that addresses all the clinical needs of your patient, the nutritional needs, the psychosocial needs, and any comorbidities that uh, uh, arise as a result of um, or are predisposing you to have TB. This is issues of mental health, substance abuse, um, diabetes, HIV co-infection, um, and so on and so forth. There are so many. And uh, as healthcare workers, we need to ensure that we are providing integrated and immediate access to holistic care for all these cases. Next. Now, in terms of treatment in Kenya, uh, we've had a bit of a history in DRTB treatment, and we are still in the process of improving our DRTB treatment. Um, up to 2017, uh, this is from 2006 up to 2017, we had conventional regimens uh, being provided to uh, TB patients. So these were semi-standardized uh, regimens based on the patient's uh, profile and picture. And this went on until October 2017, where Kenya rolled out uh, the shorter term regimen for MDR RRTB patients. Uh, and anyone who was not eligible for the shorter term regimen, as at that time, was put on individualized regimen. Uh, this includes those excluded from STR and those uh, who are pre XDR because short term regimen was for MDR and RR. And also, XDR were not eligible for short term regimen. Um, in 2020, Kenya rolled out the injectable free regimens, um, and this is uh, standardized regimens for the management of MDR, RR, uh, pre-XDR, uh, and uh, other forms of mono, mono resistance and polydrug resistance, uh, with the exception of um, uh, uh, XDR and total drug resistance who are still eligible for the uh, individualized regimens. Next, so that's the, how we've gone as a country. The medicines we are currently using, um, we have uh, medicines, uh, our regimen uses medicines in group A and group B as shown. Um, so our standard MDR RR regimen has uh, levofloxacin, bedaquilin, linezolid, clofazibine, and cycloserine. Um, in instances where you have challenges using one or more of those drugs, we bring in individualized regimens and add uh, medicines from group C. Group C. And uh, please note that um, these medicines have been put in order of preference. So the, the, the more preferred medicines are coming in group A and group B, and the less preferred are in group C. Next. For patient monitoring, um, this is just a demonstration. There is a proper uh, monitoring chart that has already been uh, supplied. Um, we need to ensure that we are monitoring our DRTB patients clinically. That is using their weight, height, um, uh, doing uh, hearing tests where needed, doing um, neuropathy tests where needed, visual tests where needed. Um, then we look at uh, lab monitoring where we have uh, uh, bacteriologic monitoring. We use uh, smears on a monthly basis. We use cultures on a monthly basis. And drug susceptibility testing is done as indicated. Um, uh, lab, uh, other routine biochemical tests, including liver function tests, renal function tests, um, uh, screening for hepatitis, screening for pancreatitis, um, looking at uh, amylase, uh, no, albumin levels. And, and so on and so forth, hemograms, um, HIV uh, follow-up tests, all these are what our patient requires as monitoring. Um, and this has been present, prevent, uh, provided to you in the, in, the, in the integrated TB guidelines, which are online on the National TB Program website. I encourage us all to access that document because it has a very updated and uh, easy to follow uh, monitoring schedule for our patients. This is a bit outdated. Next. Yeah, the other aspect of uh, quality of care is screening and management of adverse drug reactions. 
And here I wanted us to focus on autotoxicity, which is something that happened under shorter term regimen as a learning point for our current individualized regimen. So um, in, uh, in, under the shorter term regimen, uh, we had uh, about 33% of our patients uh, reporting uh, hearing loss. Um, and it was unfortunate that 33% uh, of all DRTB patients uh, in the period that we evaluated is around 2014 to 2017, it's around a four year period, was a really significant number. I can't remember the total uh, uh, number in Kenya, but this was a study done in India. What I've put up here is a study done in India, which tells us that when you put an, a, a patient on an MDR or an RRTB regimen, um, and then you screen them for adverse drug reactions well, you find that uh, about 3%, uh, 30% will have gastrointestinal symptoms um, as a result of adverse drug reactions. Um, and then other adverse drug reactions, arthralgia, psychosis, liver damage, neuropathies, uh, um, uh, vertigo, menstrual irregularities, tendinitis, hypothyroidism follow. So what it's telling us is that we need to be very keen on monitoring our DRTB patients for adverse drug reactions because we know uh, in our current regimen, um, all patients are on clofazimine, which causes uh, hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation of skin. Uh, and this can be a key contributor to patients uh, being uh, non-adherent to treatment. Uh, we're using linezolid, which causes uh, uh, severe uh, and debilitating uh, peripheral neuropathy. It also causes uh, bone marrow suppression. So we shouldn't have the same um, kind of... Uh, uh, result after using injectable free regimen as we did with the short term regimen. Next. The other comorbid conditions that we want to look at in terms of providing quality of care is for pregnancy and lactation. We know that um, uh, DRTB treatment um, largely uses medicines that are safe to use in pregnancy and lactation, especially the injectable free regimen. However, as much as possible, uh, we need to encourage the use of proper contraception at the point of uh, DRTB treatment, because while we are saying there's relative uh, safety uh, in using these medicines, there have been reported cases of um, uh, first trimester uh, abnormalities uh, being reported among uh, pregnant ladies while on DRTB treatment um, under short-term regimen and even under the uh, injectable free uh, regimen uh, currently. Um, other uh, comorbid condition is HIV. Luckily for us, Kenya has gone uh, into the optimization phase. So uh, the medicines that we use for uh, ART largely do not interact, but where there are some interactions like in the use of protease inhibitors, um, then the guidelines uh, guide very well on uh, how to make uh, adjustment to the treatment regimens to our patients. For diabetes, uh, we know that uh, screening for TB is critical amongst diabetics and bi the bidirectionals is also true, so that we need to screen for diabetes amongst our TB patients. Uh, for the guidelines also guide on uh, liver and renal disease uh, management, uh, specific with uh, how to address uh, uh, hepatic uh, transaminase elevations, um, how to uh, respond to, uh, or rather how to rechallenge uh, drug treatment for first line and second line, and then for renal disease, which medicines should we reduce the doses uh, for renal medicines. Um, we also have good guidance on the management of malnutrition in the guideline, as well as uh, issues of mental health and substance abuse. Next. Um, the other needs that our patients have is um, uh, the psychosocial needs. Um, so when you're offering quality of care, uh, one, we need to open up channels of, dis of, of, of discussions with our patients. So don't blame the sick for being sick. Even when you know that the patient has DRTB as a result of non-adherence, remember that uh, you need to boost the patient's morale. Uh, don't make the patient feel that you'll be on them if they don't do it. It's better to tell them why they need to do it. Um, treat the whole patient. This includes 
the mental needs of a patient, not just the TB. Give the patient time and as much information as possible. And this is why um, the new guidelines now give clear guidance on patient education and patient counseling on each visit. Um, strengthen the examination of our patients. Uh, these, are, these are habits that has been uh, propagated over the years that in the chest clinic, um, the couches, the examination couches are not used anymore. We just use them for storing things and people sitting on them. But what you're saying is we need to examine our patients. We need to go back to the, the basics of uh, clinical practice where you're taught to inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate so that we're not only listening to the chest. And finally, don't forget to do a mini mental state examination. Uh, with time, as you do a good history, you'll find that patients open up to you and they can tell you things around why they are not able to take their medicines, why they are not able to keep clinic appointments and so on and so forth. So history taking is a critical skill that health workers must develop with time. Next. For psychosocial support, we need to ensure that we have addressed issues about how do they access transport to and from the facility? Um, is counseling provided? Do we have admission facilities for them when these need be, especially for those with mental health issues requiring admission? And our DRTB patients have a lot of um, uh, uh, depression. Um, the, the program is currently in the, progress, in the process of collecting this data. Um, uh, depression leading to uh, either death by suicide or poor outcomes as a result of loss to follow up. Address issues of IPC at home. If it's a lactating mother, they need to be educated on how to do it. Um, provide nutritional support for the severely and moderately malnourished patients. And then for the TB program and the coordination structures is to address the health system challenges uh, to prevent interruption to, in the provision of uh, care to our patients. Next. Yeah, for the facilities and KNH is uh, such facility, we have uh, clinical review team meetings as a means of improving quality of care. Um, so these are teams that uh, monthly, on a monthly basis, they meet, review each patient's uh, record and uh, give advice to the primary caregiver to this patient on the next month's care. And uh, this, uh, can be incorporated into regional technical working groups. I know Nairobi has a very well uh, structured uh, clinical review team at county level. Um, and it also involves the HIV program in the planning of this. Next. Um, for documentation of this, remember for quality of care, if it's not uh, written, it's not done. Um, in the DRTB, um, uh, logbook, we have a checklist showing that the clinical team meets and discusses each patient on each month. And I've put up a screenshot of that. Um, it's at the end of the logbook for those with a patient, you can just go and have a look at it. We need to ensure that this is filled at each uh, monthly review by the committee. Uh, where it's missed, you just leave out the column and you can explain why the meeting was not held. Next. Now, in terms of patient support, um, what uh, the TB program advocates for and what is, what is in the 2021 guidelines is we need to scale up access to diagnosis. So uh, gene expert culture, DST, and LPA should be availed to all eligible groups. Um, we need to scale up access to baseline workup for DRTB patients. So this includes the chest X-rays at baseline, renal function tests at baseline, liver function tests, TSH, ECGs, cultures, smears, and so on and so forth. So there's already a mechanism in place for this. Um, and uh, through the subcounty TB coordinator, you can be able to access this for all your patients. Um, nutrition, all patients, DRTB patients should have nutrition assessment documented. And nutrition assessment is not only taking the weight and the height, it's using that to come up with a diagnosis on uh, whether the BMI is normal, uh, overweight or underweight, or in cases of young children, you can use Z-scores and in eligible groups, you can use um, uh, mid upper arm circumferences. 
and then documentation of what management was done for this uh, uh, nutrition management. Finally, for follow-up, um, our DRTB management cannot be complete without contact management, because as we know, um, the, it, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of case finding for TB is contacts, being an airborne uh, 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 transmission uh, kind of disease. For uh, treatment, it needs to be directly observed by a health worker. Um, and this can either be observed in the community, meaning the health worker visits the patient on a daily basis. It can be done in the facility where the patient visits the facility on a daily basis, or it can be done as in the case of KNH uh, isolation in an inpatient setting where uh, this is done by the health worker supervising uh, dots on a daily basis. Um, health insurance. It is our responsibility as health workers to ensure that our DRTB patients have NHIF cover. And the reason for this is we've seen the likelihood of adverse drug reactions as a result of treatment, which may require hospitalization or uh, specialized investigations. So um, it's important to follow up with our patients and ensure that they have NHIF cover. Uh, previously, the TB program has been providing this to the patients, but I think this is something that has been uh, stopped for a while and we'll be considering it again from September um, due to challenges with the National Health Insurance Fund. Um, for the patient's uh, economic status, uh, follow up on the payments on the monthly stipend because we expect that these patients will come to the facility on a monthly, on a daily basis, then we know that uh, they will be incurring costs. So as a health worker, each month we need to ensure that our patient has received the stipend. And if not, we work with our sub coordinators to ensure that uh, AMREF, uh, who is the, the, the recipient of these funds, um, has, uh, has gotten the report that a patient has not been paid at a certain particular month. Uh, quality of care again, follow up of cultures and smears, ECG, very critical, especially since we're using new drugs, bedaquilin, delamanid, and repurposed drugs like clofazimin, and any other lab work that may be required. This morning I've had a, a case where we are suspecting a patient to have um, uh, uh, acute pancreatitis with, uh, with associated uh, uh, bleeding tendency. So this is a patient who requires more uh, specialized investigation. And all this is available to our DRTB patient at no cost to them, as long as the SCTNC is aware and has gotten approval for them. So let's work with our TB coordinators to ensure we are providing quality follow-up in terms of the lab. Finally, on drug safety, it is our responsibility as health workers to not only identify adverse drug reactions, but to manage them and then report them to the TB program as well as the pharmacy and poisons board. And I think this is a, a, a topic for a, a, another webinar where we go through what are the possible adverse drug reactions, um, how do you identify, how do you manage, and then how do you report them for further action at national level. Next. Oh, that's, that was my last slide. So let's work together to do something, do more, do better uh, with the few resources that we have. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm open to any questions that may come up and I hand back to Dr. Tabitha. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Washira, for that elaborate and well-articulated presentation. Uh, judging from the questions that are coming in, it was much needed and very timely. I will just summarize um, your presentation. Um, started with telling us the good news that um, DRTB care in Kenya uh, was central, decentralized a few years back. And as a result, Kenya was moved from the 30 high burden DRTB uh, countries. However, we remain in the, the list for the 30 high burden DSTB countries. Um, at the core of DRTB prevention and surveillance is one timely and appropriate and complete management of DSTB, uh, as well as timely diagnosis of DRTB by doing surveillance for the high risk groups, uh, which include uh, those who have been previously treated, contacts of DRTB, healthcare workers, refugees, and those who are poorly responding to DSTB. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Now there are a few questions. The first question is uh, kindly differentiate between uh, DRTB and XGRTB. Back to you, Dr. Tari. Thank you. Um, so I apologize that I didn't go into the basic sciences uh, behind DRTB. I think we can organize another session, we can have that. Um, so um, DRTB, drug resistant TB, is, um, is, is classified in many ways. So you first, you can classify it by the pattern of resistance. And under the pattern of resistance, you can classify it as either monoresistant TB, uh, which is a TB that is resistant to any of the first line drugs except uh, rifampicin. Um, the second category is uh, MDR, uh, RRTB, MDR TB, um, multidrug resistant TB is that that is resistant to both rifampicin and isoniazid. We have uh, rifampicin resistant TB by itself. Uh, we have uh, pre XDR TB, and this is uh, any multidrug resistant TB case that has um, uh, further resistance to a fluoroquinolone. Um, and this is the new uh, 2021 uh, definition for uh, pre XDR TB. And uh, for XDR TB, is any MDR who has documented uh, resistance to any of the uh, group A drugs used in the second line uh, treatment. Um, so this includes uh, bedaculin, uh, lemofloxacin, moxifloxacin, and uh, linezolid. So that is the new classification based on uh, resistance pattern. Uh, and I think I can share some, uh, as I'm sharing these slides with, uh, with you, Tabitha, I can also share a, a slide on the revised classification of uh, DRTB so that the participants also have it with them. Maybe I can move on to um, the next on chat. So yes, we, can. yes, we yes. address them. Please do um, so. There's, there's someone who is not uh, named anonymous who says, not a question as such, but an area of concern. A patient under palliative care uh, on C. esophagus recently died of MDR. How can one suspect it on physical examination? Now, that is a very specific uh, uh, question. And what we are saying is um, we need to have a very high index of suspicion for TB, even in cases where you might have another diagnosis, because having a C esophagus does not mean you cannot have TB. So what it means is you may not differentiate on physical examination, but based on history, um, ideally there will be additional symptoms from what the patient had had, Remember, CA esophagus will have fever just like TB, will have weight loss just like TB. However, um, the primary symptoms will be uh, localized symptoms in the throat or, or, or in, in the esophagus. So the patient will have complaints of difficulty swallowing and so on and so forth. But with TB, uh, it will come like uh, other uh, new symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms. So our history is critical here. And then secondly, um, using imaging at the right time so that uh, we are able to access uh, proper imaging, uh, be it a CT scan, be it an MRI where it is needed, um, and we are able to identify these cases early. Um, we also have in our guidelines a chapter on um, uh, palliative care for patients with terminal illnesses. So you, you find that you have a CA esophagus patient who has MDR TB then really it is not advocated for you to put uh, the patient on treatment for MDR TB because um, in as much as you will treat the TB, you are unlikely to improve um, the quality of life for this patient because of the terminal condition that they're currently having. So this is a discussion that can be had by the clinical team and handled on a case by case uh, basis. Then Elikana uh, writes, how should I treat a patient who was INH resistant Having treated him for two months, but culture results came back as rifampicin heteroresistance. So Elikana, um, now you have what is called a, a, a management decision to make. So if you treated for two months for INH monoresistance, then at this point, you cannot just introduce um, any uh, new medicines because uh, you will have to change two or more of the medicines 
um, in your regimen. And anytime you have to change two or more medicines in a regimen, what that means is that you need to declare a treatment failure for the, the current ILH molar resistance treatment. And then um, you have your new classification as an RRMDR TB patient who is previously treated. So that's how you'll handle that patient. And the RR regimen is very different from that for isoniazid mono resistance. So you cannot continue with the same regimen as isoniazid mono. Um, Franklin, uh, do anti-TBs interfere with breastfeeding? Um, uh, what I'm getting from that question is, uh, do anti-TBs, is, is breastfeeding uh, contraindicated when you're on anti-TB treatment? And the answer is no. Um, studies have shown that um, Yes, there's a bit of uh, uh, expression of the, the medicines in the breast milk. However, um, it is not uh, sufficient uh, to reach uh, the concentrations um, in the child that would cause either drug resistance if the child is latently infected or uh, that would cause adverse drug reactions in the fetus. So it is recommended because of the, the, the benefits of breastfeeding to the child and to the mother in terms of bonding um, that you all people with TB, uh, be it drug resistant or drug susceptible, uh, uh, actually breastfed and they, uh, uh, um, what is this word for it? Um, they practice infection prevention and control while breastfeeding. Rachel asks, patient with drug-induced hepatitis due to RH uh, that is in the continuation phase, what is the next approach? Diagnosis uh, uh, was abdominal TB. Um, you guys have very interesting cases. Um, so Rachel, um, this is another one that I'll tell you it's case by case. Um, the, the drug that most commonly causes uh, um, hepat hepatic uh, drug-induced liver injury um, is pyrazinamide uh, followed by isoniazid. So uh, in most patients, uh, we say uh, once the transaminases come back to normal, uh, or stabilize, they, 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 there is a challenge that is done, beginning with the least likely drug to cause uh, um, liver injury. And then if you go all the way to, uh, you have uh, rifampicin and isoniazid, then you don't reintroduce pyrazinamide. So in your case, uh, what I'd say is involve, uh, I don't know if this is in KNH, but whatever it is, involve your STLC they will help you in the management of your patient in terms of rechallenge and management. Uh, but in most cases, it is pyrazinamide that is the causative agent. Um, there's another anonymous. Is there a role for prophylaxis for those living with people with DRTB? Is there a difference in drug if they are children or are pregnant? Thanks. Uh, I wish I had a name because this is a great uh, question. So um, globally, this is the discussion that is going on. Um, TB preventive therapy for contacts of drug resistant TB. Um, in Kenya, we have not yet agreed on the approach to use, um, largely because the drug that is being experimented with globally is uh, levofloxacin. And levofloxacin is among our key core medicines for our uh, injectable free regimen and the future regimens that are coming up, including the shorter six month regimen for DRTB. So we would not be willing to uh, use a uh, levofloxacin for prevention, uh, Kenya being such a high burden country for TB. So we are yet to make a uh, decision on the, di the direction that Kenya will take. And it's likely to be a decision that will be taken under the next strategic plan, which will be developed in the next year. Um, there's another question. What are the plans to transition to the recently WHO approved BPAL, BPAM regimen for MDR, XDR? Again, I wish there was a name attached to this question um, because this is one of the things that I really wanted to get uh, feedback on. There was a conference held in South Africa about two weeks ago where the country was represented by our DRTB focal person. And um, Kenya uh, has agreed to transition to the shorter oral, all oral regimens, that is uh, bedaquiline, pretermanid, and nefofloxacin and another one uh, with moxifloxacin uh, uh, as an addition. What is uh, the current state is that the committee of experts at national level will be meeting at the end of this month. 
um, to, to finalize on selection of regiments and development of a roadmap for the scale up for the for the rollout of the new regiments. So um, this is a work in progress, and uh, Kenyatta is, as always, will be uh, greatly involved in the, in the policy development process uh, since you have a lot of experts with you. There's another one on uh, also in patients with DRTB undergoing aerosolizing procedures like EGD. What mechanisms can be put in place to prevent transmission to healthcare workers besides the use of face masks? So um, it depends on where this is being done. Um, there are some facilities that have negative pressure rooms, so it's encouraged to do such procedures in negative pressure rooms. But since most facilities are not able to do that, um, especially during endoscopy and bronchoscopy, because bronchoscopy is one of the single most greatest contributor to aerosol uh, development, um, so it, we just uh, stress on uh, physical, uh, physical protection using the masks or respirators. Um, second, environmental controls, making sure that these rooms either have adequate ventilation or have uh, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation and so on and so forth. So um, this is not something that I can respond to, but um, the mechanisms are varied and it depends on the IPC committee and the resources available to the facility. Um, I see Annette, thank you. Ibrahim, on baseline workup, since we are using linezolid in our regimen, can we add eye assessment? Yes, Ibrahim, you are absolutely correct. Not only can we, we actually have, and that's why I encouraged you to go to the guideline and get the correct uh, monitoring schedule. Because as part of baseline workup, they includes issues of substance screening, it includes issues of mental health assessment. It, it includes issues of peripheral screen, neuropathy screening and visual testing so that our patients receive the full um, uh, uh, quality of care. Eda asks, are anti-TBs teratogenic? Well, it depends. Um, uh, it depends on the class of medicines. Um, a lot of the medicines that we dropped when we brought on the injectable free regimen are uh, class C and above. So they are considered relatively safe for use. However, it's not 100%. So we, we require the reports that come from health workers on uh, reported instances of teratogenicity when patients were using these medicines. Um, remember, a lot of the drugs we're using now are new drugs. Um, new meaning they were not used previously for treating TB. Um, so we also have repurposed drugs, which were used for treating other conditions like clofazimine was used for treating uh, um, leprosy. Uh, linezolid for a long time has been used for treating um, uh, resistant bacteria in the uh, intensive care units. So these are drugs that we are yet to learn their uh, toxicity profiles, uh, especially as related to uh, teratogenicity. So we need more information from you. And I'm encouraging health workers to report any adverse drug reactions or adverse events that you experience while on this treatment. If patients are resistant to fluoroquinolones, this is from Sylvester, what is the next step in their management? So um, this, it depends on the drug susceptibility testing. Um, uh, so this will be handled on a case by case basis, but if they become um, a quinolone resistance, then uh, we can use a combination of bedaquiline and delamanid in the regimen and we leave out um, the quinolone, that is levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. This again will be on a case-by-case -case basis. And what is the optimal duration again from Sylvester? Duration of therapy from, for MDR-TB. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the programmatic uh, uh, organization of uh, DRTB in Kenya, uh, we have a standardized uh, regimen uh, duration, which is 18 months. And this 18 months, um, the basis is that uh, for any DRTB case uh, to be cured without a relapse, you need to have 15 months of continuation therapy from continuation phase from the point of uh, conversion. And I know this is a very complicated statement I'm making, but this is a statement that is qualified very well in our guideline. So it means that uh, since we're using a regimen that has been shown to convert 
within the first month or two, then for MDR-RR, the minimum duration of treatment should be about 17 months. So we usually just put it standard at 18 months for anyone who might convert after month two, but we don't ever foresee a case where a patient will convert after month two. And if they do, it is usually handled on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with the county clinical team and the national clinical team. And I think I've responded to the next one on how soon is the sputum expected to be negative? Um, in the injectable free regimen, and uh, a lot of the healthcare workers here will bear me witness, um, the mean duration is between one and two months. So you will have uh, your patient being culture negative at the end of month one or month two. So that is the expectation. But it can go all the way up to month three, uh, but should not go beyond month five or six. Um, Paul asks, what should a health worker do in a resource limited setting for correct diagnosis of DRTB? Um, and, and this is a very important question because uh, we are not all working in resource uh, competent settings. Um, there are people who have uh, serious challenges even accessing a smear microscopy. So Paul, if you just follow the diagnostic algorithm that has been prepared and shared with the facilities, um, you'll note that we put emphasis on gene expert as the first test of choice. Um, in instances where you have access to, G to microscopy only, you do your microscopy and you send a sample for gene expert uh, through sample referral. So these are, I wish I knew which facility, which county you are working in, um, but what you're saying is that uh, all efforts must be made at all levels of service delivery, level two, three, four, five, six, to ensure that at first, at the first encounter with a person that we are suspecting to have TB, we need to have a drug susceptibility test done, either using gene expert, using culture, using line probe assay, or using the new uh, technology that is currently being rolled out, which is called TrueNAT. And I think I've addressed the questions, Dr. Tabitha. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Washira. There are two more questions that were shared in the chat. One is, uh, what is the place of TB lamb in diagnosis of tuberculosis? And number two is, um, how do you treat TB in pregnancy and how do you handle the infant once they are born? Over to you. Okay, uh, let me see how much time I have a bit of time. So for TB lamb, um, TB lamb in full is TB lipoarabinomanan test. And this is a test that is used among people living with HIV who have a severe illness or advanced disease or, or are hospitalized. Um, so what, what, what the basic uh, science behind this test is that um, uh, the mycobacterium, uh, when they're in the lungs, what should happen in a normal immunocompetent individual is that the, the cellular immunity should be able to address and have it as a primary focus, known as a gone focus. However, um, in people living with HIV, the cellular immunity is weakened. So the, 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 the CD4, CD8 cells are not uh, present to fight off the infection or macrophages are not uh, well equipped in terms of uh, tumor necrosis factor um, the natural killer cells are not as effective as they need to be. So these patients uh, usually get a disseminated kind of TB. Uh, once they get infected in the lungs, this is not held in the lungs. It goes through the lymphatics and the blood supply, and it can seed any of the organs in the body, uh, with exception with those that don't have an active blood supply. Um, so what it means is that for people living with HIV, you can have a negative gene expert, simply because the bacteria is all over. The yield will be very low because you've not reached the limit of detection for the test. So um, to improve the yield of TB testing among people living with HIV, TB lamb was developed as a urine test, which is a point of care test. It's a bedside test, uh, which can be done uh, uh, by any health worker who is trained to conduct it. You get a urine sample, you put, it's a rapid test kit, just like the determine kit. Um, you put a, a, two drops of urine uh, and uh, you wait for about 15 minutes and you get uh, your result uh, 
as a, a strip. So uh, there's a positive test showing that the patient has a positive strip uh, and a negative test showing that the patient has a negative strip. Um, so uh, tibilum is actually a bacteriologic confirmation, but is a bacteriologic confirmation of extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So um, it, it does not affect, uh, and the monitoring is not uh, using smears, even though it's uh, uh, bacteriologic confirmed, um, you follow it up clinically. So this is a, a new uh, modality in the country. Um, I know it's not widely available, but the TB program is, is, is working hard to ensure the availability of these kids, especially in the HIV high burden uh, areas. Um, uh, and uh, this will include uh, the referral facilities like KNH. Um, the second, so I think I've addressed the issue of TB lamb. Um, just confirm because I don't seem to see that question. Can you hear me, Dr. Awashiro? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, you have answered the question. It was shared on the chat. The Thank next you. one was up. The next question was regarding treatment of TB in pregnancy and okay. uh, if we treat okay. the baby or give prophylaxis to the child. I think for the treatment in pregnancy, I spoke during my presentation. What I left out was how to handle a baby born of a mother who is newly diagnosed with TB. Um, so uh, we do know that uh, TB can be uh, transmitted transplacentally. So during pregnancy, the bacteria can actually access the fetal circulation uh, and cause um, uh, TB within the, the in utero. However, this is uh, something that's not very common, um, but it does happen and it's good for us to know. Um, the first thing that you can do to identify this is to evaluate the placenta at birth. And uh, we are looking at the mass of the placenta. Uh, when you have TB in pregnancy, your placenta is a lot more bulky than the normal. I can't remember the values, but I do know that some midwives here have that uh, competence and they know how to do it. The second thing is to look for calcifications. Uh, because remember, as the placenta is enlarging, the blood supply is not increasing. So the areas that are watershed areas where they are not well served by blood supply, they start to die off and then you get calcifications towards the end of pregnancy. So when you get that, then that is a clear indication that your, pregnant, your child could be infected with TB. Uh, so for the child, what you'll do is you'll monitor for uh, weight loss in the initial days and you'll monitor for fever. And if any of those are there, then you can make a diagnosis of TB in a neonate and you begin treatment again. This is not, I'm not giving you 100% of the information uh, because this is a whole other topic by itself. However, the pediatrician should be involved as well as the TB coordinator so that we take uh, all the aspects into consideration. Um, now, for those children who you don't uh, confirm exposure or infection to TB, but the mother still has uh, diagnosed TB in pregnancy, then you don't give BCG. And uh, what you do instead is you give TB preventive therapy to the infant for a period of six months. Uh, what we've been using is isoniazid uh, preventive therapy. And then, uh, then you monitor the child throughout the course of TB preventive therapy. And if they complete TB preventive therapy for six months without developing any TB symptoms, then you can give BCG two weeks after the conclusion of TB preventive therapy. So um, BCG is usually suspended for any exposed or infected infant until either you complete treatment or you complete preventive therapy for this child. And again, this is another area that we have clarified in the guidelines and there's a very clear flow chart on how to handle um, a child born of a TB infected mother. Over to you. Uh, Ibrahim, I see your comment. If possible, can you share your testing algorithm, uh, especially where, when to send sample on ultra? Malawi has not yet ad adopted MTB XDR. Okay, so Ibrahim, are you from Malawi? 
because I didn't know I had listeners from Malawi in the times when I've broken off into Swahili. Maybe we'll, we'll discuss this with Tabitha um, and uh, I will share the algorithm with uh, Ken Hitch so that every participant can have access to it because this is a public document. That is one note, Dr. The webinar is open um, to healthcare workers outside Kenyatta as well. So we have um, healthcare workers from all over the country and beyond. So thank you so much, Dr. Washira, for that great presentation. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for logging in. Uh, I think we have learned a lot and uh, together we can uh, continue to help prevent and stop TB. So we have come to the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to wish everyone a good afternoon and uh, to request you to join us during the next um, webinar on the TB series. Thank you so much. Sante, it's been a pleasure and uh, look forward to engaging with you in future.